Hi, everyone. And tonight we have three wonderful readers, and I'm excited that you all could join us. Uh, this is the first and last word poetry series. And you'll notice that Harris isn't here tonight. He's not feeling well. So you just have me tonight. And so um, our first reader is Krieger der Hohenessian. His poems have appeared in over 250 literary journals, including the South Carolina Review, Atlanta Review, Louisiana Literature, Connecticut Review, and others. He is a four-time Pushcart Prize nominee, author of two chapbooks, as well as a full-length book, First Generation, by Das Madras Press in 2020. Ghost and Whispers was a finalist for the Mass Book Awards in 2011, and First Generation was a must-read in 2021. And I give you Creaker. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be reading, reading poems out of my uh, latest book, First Generation, which Gloria just mentioned. It's a book I've been meaning to write for uh, all my life um, and uh, has to do with what it was like for me um, early on and later on in my life as well as to how um, being a first generation um, descendant of genocide survivors uh, affected my life and my thinking and a lot of other things. So I'm going to be reading poems out of that book. It's dedicated to my grandfather, who was a writer and a political activist, which is why he tried to, had to get out of Turkey before they um, basically killed him. They got rid of the intellectuals and and folks like, and political people uh, and folks like that first. So he came over actually in 1910, and my mother was uh, two years old at the time. He had four children in tow and his wife and. Um, came over to the United States and uh, fled Turkey. Uh, and one thing I'd um, remembered, just as a, a prelude here, um, was the silences I experienced as a kid because nobody would want to talk about what went on. So I had to do guesswork. I had to get things by inference and by innuendo and, um, and uh, deal with the silences involved. So I'm going to read some poems out of this book. Uh, forewarning, they're not very cheerful. <laughs> the first poem I'm going to read is called The Birth of a Poet. Uh, my grandfather, as I said, was a writer, and I used to sit and watch him write. And that's where I got my love of writing from him, sitting by his side. The Birth of a Poet. A single moment branded upon the young psyche, not the mark of Cain, but a blessing, a lover's heart etched deeply on furrowed tree bark, callow child peering in the doorway, Heirig, grandfather, hunched over his writing table, trespass upon hallowed ground I feared, and then the moment, a beckoning nod, the quickening smile puckered at the corners of his mouth, and, oh my, that seductive twinkle in his eyes. A wave of his well-gnawed fountain pen bade me sit, a tousle of my hair and back to work, a river of discourse flowing in strange, squiggly-looking characters of Armenian script. I was awash in his serenity, basked in his aura, smelled the sweetness of his presence, wishing to spend the rest of my life in that room. Uh, my second poem is entitled Death March Deir al Zor. Um, Deir al Zor is actually in Syria, and a lot of the Armenians who were marched out of Turkey, eastern Turkey, um, uh, went over the desert and ended up in Syria. As a boy, I heard the stories Zaitun, Musadakh, strange sounding names not easily rolled off the tongue, isolated sagas, heroics kept alive by those who made it to safer friendlier shores. Why did the few stay while most chose desperate flight, I wondered. But what is the measure of gallantry given the odds? An entire people reduced to bare hands, a few knives, pitchforks for weapons, 
Now, Nene, I can imagine the baggage you carried on the steamer from on the steamer from Smyrna, the nightmare that dogged you to your final breath. Now, Nene, I understand that which is a boy I could not comprehend. You, one of the fortunate, escaped to tell the story. Most of your sisters, the flowers of Armenian womanhood, had no such luck. Only their stories survived. Uh, my next poem is entitled The Secret, which I mentioned before. Of Always in whispers among the elders, the unspeakable, the weight of Ararat atop a mystery, not for public consumption. Old Armenian men hunched on cane backed chairs, drinking Turkish coffee in dim smoke blue cafes, sotto voce, exchanges punctuated by a knowing nod or arched eyebrow. Gazes wandered, eyes now and then misting over. Shame, given no words, stalked the psyche. Grief snuffed. Losses left to history. And uprooting unappeased by the promise of America. Enemy, our lot. We, the next generation, inquired with trepidation. Armenians, we were told, were smart and hardworking. The past had been stolen, not worth throwing upon. It belonged to those from Hayastan and not us, their children. Hayastan, by the way, is the Armenian word for Armenia. <laughs> the next poem is entitled The Survivors. Of those who weren't shot straight off in their homes or left hanging like rag dolls in town squares, some stuffed brooches, pendants, gold fillings into body crevices, others a family portrait, a wedding picture, scrolled under threadbare sashes, or for the more practical, larder scraps to the last march for who know how long to come face to face with the ground upon which God spat. No use the grains of wisdom panned from the placer of centuries in Ottoman millets, not worth spit, not with the blood of your blood sluicing the mud-rutted streets. So, my children, I would have no story to tell if Haif Nazar hadn't escaped the bloody clutch of Enver Pasha and Talat Bey. From the refuse of America, it is left to you to hold those birthplaces with strange names, to pass on the tales of those whose histories survive only as faces in grainy sepias or a gold ring engraved with a name a date. This next poem is entitled The Bishop's Ring. It's a story that my mother told me, one of the few I heard. Um, it's a um, poem about um, the bishop uh, from Eintab, which is where my mother and uh, grandparents were from, who showed up on their front door in America five years later. The Bishop's Ring. Like the few who had managed to stay alive, he had fled the killing fields of Anatolia, where sheep had grazed in the hush plateau, an earth once green with forage, stained rust red, the ghost silent, the wind whispering a dirge. Five years astray, the meandering journey, America, the knock at grandfather's door, empty-handed save his battered black valise, his bishop's vestments, Varkas, cassock, and mitre, and that ring, that damnable, cursed, diamond-studded ring. A few days stayed, a few days stayed, dragged to four years, to mother's everlasting indignity. The oblig obligatory morning genuflect at his feet, the kiss of his ring hand, Black-haired, pudgy fingers pressed to her lips. Ever dutiful, she sent us, her children, off to Sunday school. Congregationalists, for heaven's sake. Stayed behind to spice the lamb roast. Why don't you ever come to church, Mama? The answer, mute and the hint of a sneer at the corner of her mouth. 
that I see a tear forming in one eye. She turned her back, opened the oven door, and the aroma of garlic, rosemary, and lamb, sweet in the nostrils, for the moment, enough. Have time for two more, Gloria? Yes. Okay, great. This next one's entitled, What Do You Do? This is a quote from Hovanas Tumanian, who was an Armenian writer, poet, who was uh, killed in uh, 1915. Armenian grief is a fathomless, boundless sea. That's the epigraph. What do you do with the ghosts of melancholy that lurked in dark, dusty niches? What do you do with what lay what was with what lies that lay hidden like a smoldering peat bog? What do you do with a thirst for what was lost, hanging like beads of fog on the skin? What do you do with the weight of the unspeakable, the grief which you could not lift? These tears I shed that fall on your headstones under the weeping willow, these tears are for you. This last poem is entitled Passage to Ararat. It was written for Michael J. Arlen, who was an Armenian writer and whose father was also a writer. I've read a couple of his books. Passage to Ararat. Walking on stones with souls bared, that's what it must have been like. Your pilgrimage, antithesis of your fathers on the winding park road of the diaspora, Plovdiv, Paris, London, he chose Anglophilia, changed his name, became an English dandy, writer of British romances spoken with Oxfordian perfection. Worse yet, the mocking of his forebears is quirky, and besides, the language was impossible. His identity and yours doused with the acid of his shame, vaporized. Brave soul, you chose the journey, the one he could never imagine. The road back, Yerevan, where the eternal flame burns, where you tossed a yellow rose into the burning oil, your tears a cascade down your cheeks, like snowmelt from the slopes of Ararat, the tears your father could never shed. Thank you. Thank you, um, Krito. Okay. And our next reader is Ron A. Kalman. He was born in Israel to parents who fled Budapest during the Hungarian Revolution. His poems have not only been widely published, but they've been translated into several languages, have appeared in more than a half a dozen countries, and been included in an anthology of world poets. His chapbook, Appearance of the Sun, is available from Main Street Rad Publishing, and I give you Ron. Oh, thank you, Gloria. Uh, and uh, I'd also like to thank Harris for having here, me here tonight. So I'm going to be reading from my chat book, uh, which is the uh, appearance of the sun. And the first poem is entitled uh, Shop Run, which is the name of a a uh, small town in Hungary on the Austrian border, Schopran. I've come here 18 in awe of your churches, your cobblestone streets, and your clip-clopping horses. In love with Kay, her body melting, merging with my own, while outside your soldiers with their guns strapped lazily under arm, remind me that my parents, once young themselves, fled across your marsh field while bullets grazed the night sky and Russian tanks roamed Budapest where the statue of Stalin lay in ruins. Love poem. For days the dishes lie in the sink, 
till water white with soap restores their shine, then sends them to the cupboard alone. Fire alarm, 4.30 a.m. You pop up in bed like bread from a toaster, then smell the smoke in the hallway. You dress in torn jeans and stuff your poems in the refrigerator. You stand in front of the building in cold wind and drizzling rain, look for the fire truck to arrive, then find Chuck and Kathy bleary-eyed and carrying Sasha in a cardboard box. Lisa staggers down, wearing a night nightgown and sweater, and you all laugh as Chuck says, it's a surprise going away party for Lisa. The fireman says some guy left food on the stove and is lucky to be alive. You climb the stairs back to your room and lie on your bed to find the night stretched out before you, endless hours in length. And you remember that Allen Ginsberg once said, when the muse calls, answer. So when I wrote this next poem, I was working in a hospital and uh, it's entitled The Moment. I want to write a poem every night. I want to come home from the hospital with its antiseptic carpets washed and vacuumed daily and feel like William Carlos Williams. I want to lie about at night beneath the radiating bulbs of my apartment and I want the walls to dance. I want to leap from my bed to the computer and redeem the wasted years. I want to be as prolific as Bukowski. And if I hear a siren pass outside my window, is there an arrest somewhere, a fire? I want to be arrested because I am fire. I want to throw in a touch of Frank O'Hara because I love the way he wrote. I don't want any deep memory revelations. I just want one ecstatic moment every night. My love. With you, I'll argue about the fog that settled in the sink, how to eat it, sauteed with grapes as you suggest, or striped yellow like the bus we missed. With you, I'll argue till the moon turns blue, but when the sun at last appears, smiling like an empty plate, and the buildings with their stoic fears reveal petals left unkissed, we must recall they have their wishes too. So take a breath and swallow harder. Don't let the inchworms grow much taller. I'll fetch the hounds. You start to holler. poem. It's 1 a.m. and I'm dying of thirst, so I grab a Coke from the kitchen and see on the news that Bill Clinton sliced his first shot off the tea. Then I find a book on the floor and discover that Frank O'Hara, invited to read with Robert Lowell, was nervous crossing on the ferry. It was a snowy night, so he wrote poem, Lana Turner has collapsed, inspired by that day's tabloids. And the poem was a big hit with everyone except Lowell, who apologized for not drafting a poem on the spot, implying that for him, writing poetry was not such a casual affair. Winter day. It is sunny, not a good day for a revolution. Instead, I plan to go to the drugstore, buy some soap, and cough drops, then pick up my shirts from Aaron Cleaners, where, where a red-haired woman always stands behind the counter. I might mention to her that she's oppressed, yes, by the British because she's Irish, as a worker because she must sweat all day in the laundry, and as a woman ruled by patriarchal society. Or maybe I'll just say, it's nice outside. Food. What I wouldn't give for a freshly baked potato with butter dripping, 
but my refrigerator is empty, not a single thing in it, and it's been like that for years. With all the parties I go to, amidst all the drinking and talking, you'd think I'd find a slice of salmon, a cracker, but no one is eating. The stores are full, everywhere shops are bursting with pastries, with cheeses, with meats, and still all I see on TV are shows about dieting. The hospital beds are filled with bulimics while doctors and doctors' wives starve themselves. And when finally people see a hooked fish paraded down the street, they gawk as if they'd never seen the fish before. Can you blame them? I too stare because once I ate, it was good. So these next two poems are I wrote when I was corralled into uh, doing community theater with a couple friends of mine from the hospital. First one is entitled uh, A Midsummer Night's Dream. Charlotte and Dave are sitting on the steps of the Riverside Theater at two in the morning, waiting for Catherine to finish her chat with Marty, the director, while I lean while I lean against a car in front of them and Charlotte lifts her head from David's shoulder, brushes her blonde hair from her sleepy eyes and says, have you written the poem about cranberries yet? A meeting with the committee Wednesday. So far, I say, all I have are the first two lines. Cranberries, an American original, the jazz of fruit. That's good, says Charlotte, yawning. I know you'll be able to finish it. I'm not so sure, I say, but I have tomorrow off, no rehearsal, no work. I'll try. Will you, says Charlotte, letting her head fall on Davy's shoulder. That would be great, really. That would be wonderful. Actors. We're in the music room next to the stage during a performance and bottom is stretched out on a bright red love seat his athenian garb draped about him sweat dripping from his face how much longer do i have to sit here he says when is my next cue here read this i say giving him a poem partly about cranberries what's this he says i'll only read it if it has sex in it no sex only Charlotte. Oh, Charlotte, he says. You wrote a poem about Charlotte? Well then, Joe squints his eyes and reads the poem carefully. That's quite good, he says. Then, after a long pause, adds, I like provolone myself. Next time, could you write a poem about provolone? Spring Influx. Come March or April bugs invade my condo. They stream in by the tens and twenties. Ants enter in caravans complete with tents and dancers of the seven veils. With spits they set up to toast the breadcrumbs I forgot to sweep up. Spiders build castles in the corners while beetles start up jazz bands. Millipedes hold hundred centimeter dashes and time them with the clock on my DVR. There's no use trying to stop them. It's best to put on a t-shirt and try to blend in. Nineteen sixty-nine. It was the summer of sixty-nine, and I was ten years old. I had a friend named Mark who lived in half of a two-family house. His father was a carpenter and they had a bulldog that once bit me. My sister was in junior high. She wanted to go to, go to a place called Woodstock where they were having a rock festival. I imagined this as a festival for people who liked rocks. My father talked about a demonstration downtown. People had started throwing bottles and the police used tear gas. My sister who had been out shopping had to run to a church to escape. Mark's brother, Don, was in Vietnam. Once, I heard Mark's mother read one of Don's letters. 
He had to stay up nights to keep watch over the camp, to make sure no gooks snuck up on them. Later that summer, I saw an old car drive to a center divide and watched as a young guy plucked a flower. I told Mark and he said, did you yell at them? Did you yell hippie? That's what I would have done. But the next day, Mark found out that the guy in the car had been a friend of his brother. He was leaving the city and I plucked the flower as a memento. Dr. Zhang's Magic Pills. Made of Chinese herbs using ancient skills, guaranteed to cure all your ills. Take one in the morning at the start of day, one for the brave to have their say, one to help the body's healing, one to stop that annoying squealing, one to balance your chi just right, one to keep your goals in sight, one for the muse so faint her song, one to know if your thoughts are wrong, one for the rising din at noon, one for the sultry days of June, one for the masses caught in traffic, one for Wall Street, oh, so frantic, one for the bosses feeling smug, one for the workers at sullen mug, one for the catnap under a tree, one to be grateful just to be, one for the girl who sways her hips, one for the guy who looks and trips, one for the couple arm in arm, one for the lawyer, sound the alarm, one to ponder the placid moon, one for time that's gone so soon, one for the ghosts who've lost their voice, one for the rest who've got a choice, one for the sorrows that rob you sleep, one for intent that's best to keep. Life is short, boredom kills. Take Dr. Zhang's magic pills. And this, uh, my final poem here is entitled, Faint light. I'm not the sort who awakens before the sun rises. If you choose to brave a run on the hard pavement in the morning chill while trolleys creak into action, that's fine. But I prefer the solitude of a warm room, the soft glow of a lamp and the quiet that comes from the day's traffic af after the day's traffic is reduced to a whisper. I prefer the thoughts contained in a good book that might penetrate the mind and change it, or even inspire a thought of one's own. There's a certain feel to a pristine thought before it's seen the light of day, before it's been trampled by the onrush of the morning news streaming from radios and TVs. It might bear the delicacy of a leaf fluttering to the ground, which if looked at closely contains the universe in microcosm, but which later is swept aside with the rest of the debris on the street. I'm not the sort who awakens before the sun rises, but on occasion it has risen before I've gone to sleep. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. And our next reader is Denise Provost. She has been published in such journals as Ibbotson, Muddy River, Poetry Review, Poetry Porches Sonnet Scroll. She received the Maria C. Faust Sonnet Competition Best Love Sonnet Award in 2012 and the New England Poetry Club's Samuel Washington Ellen Prize in 2021. She has two poetry collections, Curious Peach, published by Ibbotson in 2019, and City of Stories, published by Jovena Barba in 2021. And I give you Denise. Thank you so much, Gloria. Thanks to you and, and Harris for inviting me tonight and for my, my co-readers, my fellow readers, and everybody who's here. I will mostly read out of City of Stories um, and a couple other things. Because this is largely a, a crowd of poets here in the Zoom room tonight, I thought I would start in a traditional manner by invoking my muse. Uh, 
in a poem called Aspiring Poet Seeks. We know the muses are all female, right? That's why men write most of our poetry. I'm searching for a muse who's just my type and wants to spend quality time with me. A lissom redhead tempted me, but then came the deal breaker. She smoked cigarettes. A blonde Madonna whispered to me. When I turned, she'd become a heartless coquette. There was a dark one once with smudgy eyes whose heavy lidded look was eloquent. I leaned in closer, quick to sympathize, but she strolled off with some loquacious gent. I can't compete with masculinity. I don't think the muses will sing to me. So, um, it, continuing with the theme of um, with poetry and you know how it comes about um, is a poem, I guess, about subject matter. It's called The Thraldom of Stuff. With tinsel in her beak, the starling flies away to weave and decorate her nest. I sympathize. I too have magpie eyes darting around eventually to rest on that which sparkles or has a dull shine, a shape alluring to behold, enough to prompt me to pick up, claim it is mine. Oh, what a truly wondrous lot of stuff I found right in the gutter of the street, a bicycle reflector, orange gold, a metal earrings, rusty filigree, a single smooth and slippery domino, as connoisseur of rubbish, well, I know just how to be as happy as a crow. And uh, on the topic of poetry, this is, um, this is a poem from my first book, Curious Peach. And it's about form, really, I think. It's called Self-Expression and it's seasonal. The falling rain experiments with form. Its aspiration is to become snow. And yet the evening air is still too warm for crystallization. Each droplet grows into such altered state as it can reach. The frozen rain bulks up, but remains splash. It longs to have the elegance of sleet whose angular art deco forms have dash and make a sharp sensation on the face, more memorable in their own way, perhaps, than pelting slush, whose brutish shapes replace granules with stinging clumps. I yearn to grasp how rain's imagination leaps so far as to emerge in fine six-sided stars. So that's, that's probably enough poetry, about poetry for now. Um, and I'm gonna read some of what I call my poetry of place. It's a poem about Somerville. It's called Commiseration. It was a kindly place, our neighborhood. We knew each other and we stayed in touch, passing on news. Though none of us had much, we shared our garden flowers, home-cooked food, gave rides to the carless. Life was good enough for most, though sorrows always loomed. We stuck together, fighting off the gloom of bereavement and loss, the way we stood with Millie when her only son died young. Helen had fallen and broken some bones, so we had to bring her walker along when we drove to the wake for our friend Joan, who never had a bit of luck, said Flo, as her car skidded out in falling snow. Let's see. Six. Um, ah, yes. And, and here's, here's another Somerville poem called The Pasha of Elm Street how he enjoyed life in that simpler time. 
escaping indoor heat, sitting outside, his feet raised up, cold pitcher by his side, surrounded by plants, his pleasure and pride. Vining nasturtiums bloomed along strings tied from porch rail to ceiling and back again, at intervals weaving a floral screen, half concealing his chaise where he reclined, fanning himself, but always with an eye for dubious strangers on the street below, whom he'd halt with his glowering stare. So no house or car break-ins during his reign. His place, now plantless, is no longer green, but tarted up for tastes of those who come to buy luxury condominiums. The past, the porch, the man himself are gone with his care of the street he oversaw. So now I'm gonna read, this, this book, um, City of Stories has a, 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 a section of um, political and topical poetry. So I guess this is a political poem. It was actually written on the end 40th anniversary of the Roe against Wade decision. I came home from work with a, a sticker from a rally and I stuck it on the calendar, which was a nature calendar. And Roe against Wade was decided in February. So my daughter came home and looked up and said, well, I'm glad the penguins are pro-choice. And that led to the pro-choice penguins. A crowd of emperors waddles on parade. From here, one sees their banners. Roe v. Wade, uphold the right to reproductive choice. They would shout out if they but had the voice about their own immense compelling need to raise successful young. Each mouth to feed a hard task on these unforgiving shores along the Weddell Sea. If they had more than one offspring at once, how would they meet the challenge to keep warm on father's feet? One precious egg. Meanwhile, each mother must hunt fish relentlessly as fathers trust their mates return. Their careful calculus for survival can allow no excess of breeding, which explains their stated goal free access to all forms of birth control. That poem is dedicated to a longtime Somerville person who, a public health nurse who was always advocating for sexual health and uh, proper education of teenagers. What a great woman Karen Edlund was. So, I'm just looking for another Somerville poem marked here. This one is called Pearl Street Ramble. A hot night, no one wants to be indoors. I'll congregate on sidewalks, porches, steps, conversing there in many dialects, the babble music of a cozy world. In tiny gardens big enough to hold two rose trees and a smiling grottoed saint, moonlight reveals petals and halo paint. I wander past a building, once the home of good friends, educated, cultured folk, well brought up, financially insecure, so genteel they could not bring themselves to recognize the works stashed by their door a cup of hypodermics on a shelf stowed by the tenants on the second floor. So, yeah, and, and here's, a, here's another, another um, poem inspired by my surroundings. It's called Requiem for a Home. I never met the folks across the way. I'd give a friendly wave, but nothing more, because I thought they simply would not stay, but move on as our neighbors have before. You know how stories travel down the road? 
it was discouraging to hear the news that their landlord's mortgage too was foreclosed. Tenants turned out now, though they wouldn't choose to leave so soon. They're packing up their rooms while listening to music. Don't you hear a great soprano soaring voice that blooms from out their open windows like a prayer that they be spared from this cascade of woe? I wonder if they have some place to go. So as you probably noticed, there's, um, there are too many sonnets. There are a lot of sonnets here. So um, just recently, um, I, I had started, started to write a sonnet about how I need to stop writing sonnets, but I lost the draft and I ended up with poetic, uh, heroic couplets. So I just finished this. This is called Towards a New Poetics. Straightforward lines of poetry have surely become obsolete, a quaint but quite outmoded thing, much like my curse of handwriting, a mode young people just don't know it could become a secret code. The sonnet form, I'm sad to say, is embarrassingly passe. I must pursue measures to break this habit. What cure can I take? Is there a 12-step program yet to forego five-foot lines? Forget iambic pentameter? No, perhaps some place where I could go to purge the urge to rhyme from me. A course of couplets therapy? So that's that one. Um, and do I have another one or two? Uh, shall I read one more? I'll read one more, which is not in form. That's why I wanted to read it. This one is titled, Shall I Marry Poetry? Should I speak the vows? Can I honor and remain irreverent? Do I have it in me to obey? Is love as satisfying over the breakfast table as it was in the back of my old car? As oddly durable. Shall I take the risk of devotion? Or better to carry on in the familiar way to say I'm working late when instead I'm out with you, a little giddy from red wine, flirting madly over long stemmed glasses. Will I love you as much over coffee cups? Will you have as much to say to me? Thank you. Thank you, Denise. That was wonderful, all of you. Um, and so now we come to our question and answer time. And um, I'm going to put you on gallery view so I can see all of you. So if you have any questions or you would like to make a comment to the readers, uh, please raise your hand. You can use the reactions button. There's a hand there that says raise hand or raise your hand. There's not that many of you here, so I can, I can see you. <laughs> so anybody want to say something? Uh, yes, Karen, go ahead. Uh, this is a fascinating reading. Thank all of you. Um, I really enjoyed it because everyone is so authentic to themselves and so different. So I really heard three very distinct voices, three different kinds of intentionalities with words, everybody using words, but memories, a lot of place memories and all very different and the emotional import of them, very different. The tonalities of the speakers, different. And I love that because I could really listen and remember. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Um, anyone else? Would you like to make a comment or question? Uh, yes, Deborah. Hi. Hi. I, I had uh, I very much enjoyed the reading tonight, um, and the intimacy of it with our small group is um, 
actually a, a pleasure of, of sorts. Um, I think that Karen um, in her comments uh, captured many of the things that I was feeling um, and thinking as I uh, read, uh, as I listened tonight. Um, and there were in, in, I was fascinated by titles and titling. It was something that I was paying attention to tonight. And uh, um, the, you know, from, from the Bishop's Ring to the birth of a poet, um, from our first reader, I I, I enjoyed uh, hearing that as well as some of the the uh, the lovely metaphors. The snow melt, I think, in the last poem, snow melt from the hills of Ararat that your father could never uh, shed or was never able to shed. It's just a, a lovely um, encapsulation of uh, of many of the poems that you read. Um, for Ron. Um, <laughs> I had a good time with um, the magic herbs, Dr. Zhang's magic herbs. Uh, it was, uh, you know, sort of fun and lilting, and um, um, and the final, um, the final line, of course, was uh, um, um, fun. <laughs> it was part of the part of the whole, um, the conjuring of place that Denise did uh, was really satisfying for me. Um, the, um, in one of the poems, she talked about the, the babble music of all of the, the dialects and it's a, a delicious, uh, a delicious turn of phrase, I think. I uh, thank you so much. I enjoyed the reading. Thank you. Um, nice reactions for all of you. Um, thank you, Karen and Deborah. Um, Mary, were you raising your hand or just giving a thumbs up earlier? Did you want to say something? I think I was just giving a thumbs up, but... Um, oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. This has really been a, such a delightful reading. And um, I guess I'm, I'm interested since Denise's work especially kind of asked the question, but maybe for all three of you to... to um, I'm curious about form and how you see form. Um, I felt like with Ron's poem that um, mentioned Frank O'Hara, it just felt like there was some kind of similarity in the voice um, in that poem and in Frank O'Hara's poem. And, and um, you know, for Denise, I, I, I guess I just would like to hear all three poets kind of talk about their relationship to form or what it means and what kinds of forms they think about or write in and why or yeah anything <laughs> thank you thank you ron you want to go first um sure <laughs> not sure it's an easy question to answer but when i was uh writing these poems i guess i was less interested in the form than just the uh, the process of writing so i was i think frank o'hara has a kind of very uh kind of a very free flowing form and i was uh greatly influenced by him uh at the time so i think i was going for kind of a uh you know um partly for a a, a stream of consciousness type thing more than a specific poetic form. Although, you know, it has changed over the years. And I've done some translations from, uh, from Hungarian and in Hungarian poetry really isn't considered poetry unless it's, uh, you know, unless it rhymes. And so, uh, so I've also, when I do the translations, I try to keep uh to the original form so i think i you know in, in in those circumstances you know form becomes more important but it uh so i guess it it has changed over the years okay thank you denise or creaker go ahead creaker you're raising your hand yeah um basically what i try to do with, with a lot of my poetry is um 
Uh, I pay attention to music and rhythm rather than rhyming or anything like that or any particular poetic form. The music or the rhythm of the poem has to be right. And I grew up with musicians and artists, so I guess that's where I got it from. But that's, that's what I like to pay attention to briefly, you know, more than anything else when I write. Thank you. Denise? Uh, yes. Um, my, my, my relationship to poetry grew out of my, my love of, of song, of, of musicality. And, and I'm always, I'm always listening for the music of language. And when poetry comes to me, it usually dictates the form that it should take, um, just by virtue of the words that fall together in my head and how I, how I hear them. And, um, you know, catch them really. Um, I don't feel like form is something that I consciously impose. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Mary, for the question. Um, anyone else have a question? Uh, Deborah, you wanted to say something else. You're muted. Yes, um, to, in, in light of Denise's um, uh, last comment that uh, she doesn't usually have form imposing itself on the uh, uh, on her poems, I'm, I'm laughing because you left us with the um, couplets therapy as you were working on, on sonnets. So, uh, couplets therapy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, then um, that will be it for tonight. And thank you. Let's give another applause to the readers. You guys were so wonderful. And our next reading will be February 15th and Harris will be back then. And so I look forward to hosting with him and um, everyone have a great week and thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, Gloria. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.